Uh, we are in our third uh, message in our series that we've been doing just right out of the gate for 2016 called Get Fit. And uh, I've been looking at this sermon from a variety of angles that have to do with us being in tune with the things of God for 2016. And like anything, uh, conditioning is always good to get yourself prepared for uh, the things that are ahead. And as I look at 2016, I'd like to think that we as a church would be uh, just in tune, a spiritually well-oiled machine. And uh, the problem is, like any conditioning, you have your challenges along the way, your temptations, things that keep you from reaching your goal. And I just wanted to uh, begin the message today by talking about my nemesis. And I'll just show a picture of it right now. Um, I... Uh, I, I know that any time I see one of these, things start happening in my body. Start salivating, and I start imagining all the seasonings that are involved in the beautiful little sliced wafers of potato that have um, a richness to them that sometimes is just irresistible. I know a lot of you guys have had breakfast just recently, so that probably didn't tantalize you too much. But imagine going into uh, the grocery store on an empty stomach. You know the wisdom of that. Um, and I was uh, with my wife, and we were going to eat lunch together. And we said, well, let's go to Ruley Brothers and go do our shopping first. And I'm starving. She's starving. But I'm not letting on. And... Um, I'm in the checkout line and I see this medium sized bag of barbecue chips and uh, I, I'm checking out by myself and she's still shopping and she's not aware that I see it nor is she aware that I purchased it. However, in order to ease my conscience, I thought, well, that's big enough for her and I to enjoy together. And I went out to my truck and I'm sitting out there listening to some music, waiting on her. And I open up that bag and I'm thinking five or six, just kind of, kind of just get me a little bit satisfied for, uh, for, for the trip to uh, the, um, uh, the restaurant. Well, there is something evil inside of barbecue chips that is lurking. And it is something that activates a process in your body that tells your body you are hungry and at the same time informs your brain you need some more of those don't you <laughs> and so I ate about a dozen of them and then I looked at that bag and I, I rolled it up really tight and I put it out of my sight well I'm sitting there for about 30 seconds and my wife is still inside and I'm thinking I'm still hungry and I open it up and I eat about a dozen more and that process of temptation versus self-control versus loss of self-control versus indulging versus pretty much eliminating the whole content of the bag before she got out there um, was one that I honestly am ashamed of. <laughs> so I'm confessing my sins, like the Bible says, to one another. There it is. Well, the relationship that we have with our body is an interesting one. Um, and it's one that the Bible does talk a lot about, believe it or not. And there are important things that are said about the, bo the body that I, I think we, especially in the times that we live in, we've got to pay attention to. And I'll just, I'll just remind you of a few. Uh, one of them, Paul's talking about people using their bodies in ways that, that they shouldn't. And he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 19 through 20, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And Paul is just making a statement about our body that it should be used for a, a good purpose that is in concert with the Lord's purposes. 
And there's a few other things that he says. If you look on your message notes, you'll see these three passages of Scripture listed. Uh, one we've been referring to a lot lately is from Romans 12, uh, 1 through 3. And in the first verse of that, Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so something about what we do in worship is also expressed through the bodies that God's given us. And then finally, Paul makes a statement to Timothy that we read two weeks ago. And in it, he said, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, and Paul noted that as, Tim, as well as Timothy and Titus, uh, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, there was a lot of confusion uh, as the church began to spread and make uh, the gospel known to people around the Mediterranean world. And a lot of it stemmed from the fact that there was a philosophy that was in the air that the Greeks had said for a number of years, and that was the spirit or the mind is good and the body is evil. And they had this view that basically said the physical reality that we live in is just through and through tainted with all kinds of evil and your body included uh, is part of that mix. Well, that had actually affected the church so much that there were people who later on became church leaders. And when they looked at the body, they looked at it through a distorted lens. And let me just share with you a few of the things that by the time the medieval period happened, um, uh, uh, some of the church uh, leaders at the time uh, had things to say about the body that were negative. One was by St. Bar Bartholomew of Farns. He said, we must inflict our body with all kinds of adversity if we want to deliver it to perfect purity of the soul. And he saw, along with others, the body as sin's instrument. Um, and it should be just brutally tamed. And other church fathers said that um, we should control the body through self-flagellation, fasting, sleep deprivation, and uh, one uh, church uh, leader, St. Dominic, would beat himself three times a night, once for his own sins, once for the sins of the world, and once for the sins of those in purgatory. Now, if you look at that, it seems like madness. It is uh, this sense that the body is evil and shameful and everything about it, whether it's our, our appetites or food, for food or appetites for sexuality, appetites for things that have to do with greed and every imaginable vice. And it was all centralized in the body. And as they took that view, it, it kind of carried over through time and space, even into our world where we're confused about what the body is supposed to be and do and how we're supposed to relate to it. And, and even in my own development as a Christian, I really wasn't sure how I should understand my body. Um, and so I wanted to remind uh, us some of the things that God said about our bodies so that we can get off on the right track here. Uh, there's a few statements that I'd like to make uh, from Scripture that just helps set the stage for this so that we're not too confused. And the first one is, uh, our bodies are considered a good thing from God. Did you know that? When God created the, the heavens and the earth, each day he said it was good. But on the sixth day, whenever he made man, male and female, in his image and likeness, he said that is very good. And we read that from Genesis 1.27. And as, um, as he said that, um, I don't know if that scripture is connected to that or not, um, but um, uh, if not, let's just go on to uh, the next point. Yeah, there we go. Uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made as well. David wrote in the Psalm 139, a beautiful psalm about our physicality. He said, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. And as you look at everyone in the room, we all look different. But when God looks at us, he says with the psalmist, it's very good and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's a very positive statement about our bodies. And here's another thing about the body. God clothed himself in a body. In Philippians 2, we read a beautiful poem uh, that is theologically uh, uh, part of Paul's statement here. He said, but Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And if bodies were evil like the medieval people thought, God would not be associated with it in any way. But God said, there is something very good about us. And my son is going to be present in your life in bodily form so that you can relate to me in a way that you never have before. You can see how I would function if I were a human being. And in every uh, manner of behavior that Christ conducted himself with, he displayed what God would do in each situation so that we ourselves could kind of wrap our minds around the fact that um, uh, we can understand his ways a little better. And he did that through becoming one of us. And then uh, finally, uh, God declared it very good in Genesis 1.31. I mentioned that a minute ago. And uh, there's a last statement that I wanted to make. Um, and, and that is, our bodies are a vessel for the Holy Spirit. And the scripture that I read at the very beginning of the message said that our body is a temple for the Holy Spirit within you. So there's something very positive about our bodies that God said is very good. But Paul goes on to write about the body saying that in a lot of ways, not only is our character corrupted, but our body as well. And we've been born into a sinful world where the characteristics of that world have defined your life and mine. And um, if, if you're a parent, uh, how many of you, when you're raising your children, did something or said something to your kid that was exactly like what your parent did to you or said to you? It was almost like the words came out of your mouth and you're like, oh, I can't believe I said that. I sound like my mom or I sound like my dad. And we just absorb these tendencies. Some of them are actually very good. Some of them, however, need to be reset. And God looks at us and he loves us as we are, but he loves us so much that he wants to move us into a place where we're more like his son, not only in our character, but also in our bodies. And I believe one of the reasons that is is because... He's destined us to live forever in a glorified body. And he said the change process begins now. And he tests us in a variety of ways to help us to get in tune with how we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now I have a feeling that whenever I was in line looking at that bag of potato chips, I wasn't thinking about offering my body as a spiritual sacrifice to the Lord. I only had one thing in mind. I am hungry. My wife is too slow. That bag of chips is tempting. I have a credit card right here. It's all adding up. I can control this. I have it all really well in hand. And there's something about self-delusion that factors in as well that God says, i got to rescue that from... I've got to rescue yourself from that as well. So, if formed in sin, our character and our bodies are set against God and his ways. And we just got to, over time, we've got to come correct in our heart, our mind, and our bodies before the Lord. And we, got to, we have to get fit even in that realm. Now, we live in a culture, actually, that literally worships the body. And all you have to do is, you know, while, while I'm looking at barbecue chips on the one hand, on the other hand, there is just uh, this array of bodies on magazines that promise that we can look like that. And the unreality of it is most of those bodies have been airbrushed. 
And while you can airbrush those bodies, you cannot airbrush our bodies. Uh, they still have all of their imperfections about them. And it's a sad fact that because the body is so elevated to almost godlike status, that it puts a, a, an undue amount of strain on both men and women alike. Women especially who want to adorn themselves and, 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 and look beautiful as God has designed you to, to, to be that way. Uh, but when you look at surveys after surveys, their 80 to 90 percent of women are dissatisfied with their bodies. And about 50 percent of the men are like, yeah, mine's, I got problems with mine too. And the, 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 the untold millions of dollars that go into modifications so that we can preserve that image of our body and project it to the world around us, uh, it's staggering to consider just how off course this, this is. And um, it has created in the minds and hearts of many, females especially, eating disorders and, uh, and, and a variety of other issues that have to, have to uh, really go down those lines. Now, I, I'm trying to be very careful here because um, I have a wife who corrects me often when I try to weigh in on the female of the species. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, but um, one thing that I do know is we share in common this confusion about a lot of things that have to do with ourselves and the world around us that God says is at work in us. And, and I'd just like to describe how that confusion works. When Paul addressed it in Romans chapter uh, 7, uh, th this is what he said um, in, the next, um, in the next part of this. He said, our body habits often reflect what's going on inside. He said, for while we are living in the, we're living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. And there's this ongoing dialogue between our, our, our brain and our body that is conducted apart from God and is only interested in itself and its cravings. And the biblical word that is used to describe that is the flesh. And the flesh is a term that Paul uses to describe our way of life when God is not in the picture. We just do whatever it is that those drives in us tell us that we should do. Now there are some people in their flesh, all they can think about is barbecue chips. There are some people in their flesh that all they can think about is being anger, angry. And, and, and the list just goes on and on of ways that the brain and the body communicate through ideas and through hormones and through these things escalating into actions that are really destructive. And God said the law came and it cast a light on that and named it for what it was. And it's kind of like, yeah, I see that, Lord. I know that that bag of chips is bad and I'm going to stay away from it for about eight seconds <laughs> until I'm distracted by my body saying, I'm hungry, feed me. And it just goes on and on. So Paul tries to help us with that by just naming it and saying, there is a struggle going on. And, um, and, and, and you, need to, you need to probably deal with it. And as Paul writes, he writes some more words that I think are, are helpful for clarity. And one is from Romans 8. Uh, in, this, uh, in this awesome chapter, by the way, um, he writes, Our bodies are at war with God's spirit because they have been conditioned towards sinful responses. If you grow up in a, in a house where there's lots of gluttony, chances are you're going to kind of get caught up in that. If you grow up in a house where there's lots of anger going on, chances are you're going to get caught up in that and your body's going to learn to respond to that. If you grow up in a house where there is boundaryless sexualized behavior going on, chances are your body's going to get caught up in that. And in these patterns of behavior that we've sort of absorbed Paul says, for those who live according to the flesh, that is patterns of behavior that were not in tune with God, they'll set their minds on the things of the flesh. 
But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Notice how it's important that we understand where our mind should go on this. For the for those who set their mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. <laughs> I've actually memorized this verse because I understand that conflict. And it's helped me just to know that this is going on, not so that I beat my body three times a night saying, <laughs> once for this, once for that, and once for the other thing, but rather I look at my body and I say, Body, how am I supposed to manage you? And God said, with the help of my spirit. Because my spirit is now in you, enabling you to relate to your body in a healthy way. You know, you look at the medieval people, and they're doing these bizarre things, and it gets even more bizarre. I didn't go into some of the things that people do to mutilate or, 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 or really abuse their bodies in order to say, I'm, I'm, I want to be... I want to be rid of this evil vessel. Uh, it is pathological behavior, in my mind, to respond to your body that way. I, I believe that the Jewish people had a better understanding of the body. They, they, they like, even like our Lord, they enjoyed meals with other people. Uh, they actually enjoyed a glass of wine occasionally. They would dance whenever they would worship. And everything that they did was like very bodily. And when you look at the Jewish people, you find that throughout the Old Testament scriptures and even in the times of Jesus, there's a lot of body involvement in the things that are done relative to God. But they're done in, in, in a seemingly God, godly way in general. And when you look at the, the people who are in the medieval period who've inherited a lot of this Greek philosophy, they've got this idea, worship is about the spirit, the body's evil, and there's not a lot of bodily engagement in the history from the medieval period up through the Reformation and on of the body being engaged. And we even do that when we worship. It's sort of like we're worshiping from here on up. But anything else about the body... No, we can't do that. That's, that's, not, that's not good. But the Jewish people had, really, they engaged the whole part of it. And there's maybe some wisdom that we can gain from them that Paul did as well. But he starts off with the role of the Spirit in your life and mine, just to conclude that thought. And then uh, as we move on in our understanding of body habits that remain in our redeemed bodies, um, we retrain new habits with the help of God's Spirit. Now what I mean by that is God has redeemed our mortal bodies according to 1 Corinthians 6. And so even our bodies are being saved. Yet, like anyone who comes to church for the first time, and maybe the next week they come again in a couple weeks, they're saying, I want to get baptized. I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. I know full well that there's a lot of habits of thought that they've had up to that moment that God's going to be undoing over the course of time. Matter of fact, it's going to be through the course of their whole lifetime like God has been undoing in your life and mine and redoing as we receive instruction from Him uh, by being discipled through just the course of life. You know, I've known you guys for about 10 years, and I've seen pictures of, of, of you guys 10 years ago, and I've seen pictures of you guys now, and I include myself in this. There have been some little changes, just a little bit. I'll just say we're all just more mature. How's that? Things happen over time that God uses to make us into something that he wants us to become. And he's bringing our bodies along for the ride. And his spirit is enabling that. So he said in Romans 8, 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 
Just the same thing that he mentioned in 1 Corinthians. God is at work in your body and mind. And as a pastor, I have responsibility to help you understand what that relationship is. And I know we live in a bodily uh, 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 obsessed culture. And I know that they're both men and women alike probably spend more time getting their bodies ready for worship so that we look right as opposed to our spirits or hearts. And God sees that and he knows what we're dealing with and he loves us where we're at but he wants to move us along where it's less and less about us looking better than our neighbor or like our neighbor and more about us looking like Jesus. And I think that's pretty awesome. You know, as you're going through this and you're thinking, I wonder what Leonard's going to be preaching on about the body. And, you know, I have a body like everybody else. And I have to relate to it like everybody else in all its variety. And my best go-to for understanding that is just to ask the questions. What does the scripture say about the body? And hopefully at this point you understand that it's good, but it tends towards rebellion sometimes. Um, so let's go on to the next part of this. There are three habits to keep the body and spirit together fit for the new year that I, I just want to mention uh, in closing. And, and the first one is don't idolize your body, but release it to Christ's lordship. Let him shine in you. Now, our culture, like I said, idolizes bodies. And we look at that and we go out into the arena of humanity and there's so much maintenance given towards how we project to others that God's completely out of the equation. And you and I can get caught up in that and it, it can become something that we're obsessed about and it becomes an idol in our lives. But when God looks at your body and mind, he's saying, I don't mind you adorning yourself. I think that's awesome. I made you good in that way. But I also want to, at the same time, work on the godliness that is inside of you. And there's nothing more beautiful than a person who has allowed Christ to just really characterize their whole life. And it doesn't matter what the person looks like on the outside as much as what you're experiencing on the inside. And there's nothing more ugly in my mind than a beautiful person, male or female, that is just corrupt through and through in their heart, that lives by the flesh and has all of those vices that Paul talks about in a variety of places, especially after he mentions the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and 6. Let him shine through you. Whenever you're, some of you have been married for a long time, and when you look at your spouse, are you like sizing up exactly what they look like? Or are you looking at what's going on inside of them? Now be honest. That was a part of us sometimes where my wife will go. And I'm like, she must have an itch. <laughs> Notwithstanding the fact that, you know, I've got a piece of food on my mustache. And she's just trying to be kind. But overall, it's just an awareness of who she is in her whole being, and myself included. It's, a, it's really a wonderful thing. And when we show Christ, there is a beauty that is at another level. And God says, I want that to shine through you. Secondly, don't misuse your body. Use it for good. And by that, I mean this. You can, of course, worship your body. You can use the strength of your body to best other people in ways that put them down because maybe you're smarter or maybe you're stronger and you leverage that to tyrannize other people. Or you can use your body in a way that manipulates other people. Don't misuse your body. Or you can use your body in ways like Paul was talking about in those passages in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 that are uh, sexually inappropriate. Use it for good. And here's the last thing. It's pretty simple. Honor and care for your body. 
And I wonder, am I taking care of my body when it comes to nourishment, to exercise, to rest? I encourage you to read the story of Elijah after he had had this awesome mountaintop moment. He had cast down fire on uh, the offering that the prophets of Baal were destroying their body to try to make happen through their gods. And it was a huge win for God. And when Jezebel heard about this, she said, I'm going to kill you. And Elijah all of a sudden ran away. And he ran for miles. And he became depleted. And he became so depleted that he became sort of not rational. And he started thinking about killing himself. Because he was hungry. He was tired. And he hadn't rested. And scripture says an angel came and gave him some good scriptures to think about right now. No, the angel didn't do that. The angel came and the angel said... Here's some bread. Here's some food. Get some rest. And maybe your body right now isn't where it needs to be because, well, maybe you're not, maybe you're like me, you need to repent of the barbecues. <laughs> or you need to mix in a few more salads and a little less milkshakes. Or perhaps you, like my doctor told me the other day, my cholesterol was a little bit high. What are you eating? And I said, I've been eating sausage every day for breakfast. And she just looked at my, me and said, no, <laughs> eat eggs. So I'm listening to her and I'm going to eat some more eggs. Exercise. I think, no, just my friend Denny Niederheiser, even though he's retired, exercises about every day. Is that right? And you're up and walking around. Now, part of it may be he's just tough as nails. Part of it may be his wife was cracking the whip. Part of it probably is he just took care of himself. And this is a result of it. Um, so when God looks at all of these things, he's saying, in combination, I've made your body fearfully and wonderfully, but you've got to take care of it. It's just very simple, very basic. You don't have to be extreme. Like you're worshiping food, saying, I got to go to the vegan place, and if I don't get the vegan place, it's all off. Exercise, it's great to exercise. Many of us do. I know Jason does. He says he's very fit, and it helps. I mean, the reason I exercise is because I got a lot of stuff I want to do, and I want to stay healthy. There was a time when I weighed 215 pounds, and uh, I said, My legs are hurting. And I decided that, now nah, I just got to get in shape because I got a lot of road ahead. And then rest. Some of you, maybe you're resting, maybe you're not. And the place to begin with rest is with the Lord. There's nothing more soothing than connecting with Him and maybe reading the Psalms if you've got insomnia and allowing just His Spirit to give us peace to ease our mind, and to help us know that whatever it is that's gnawing at us, God is in control. And God is our provider. And God loves us as his children, and he'll watch over us. And it took me a long time to absorb that. Because I've had some sleepless nights. Had some sleepless nights working here. But I don't have as many sleepless nights anymore because I told the Lord, even in that area of my life where I'm trying to take on con controlling things that are out of my control, I just give it to you. And my body thanked me. And my spirit did as well. And maybe even the people around me. And I wonder, what is your relationship with your body? And it is a big question that is intimately connected to worship. Because Christ broke his body so that we would be made whole. There's something sacred about our bodily being that Jesus said, this is so important, the best way I can show you what the new covenant is all about is through a broken body so that 
you, body, mind, and soul can be healed. Is he in your life? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Can you honestly say he is my Lord and Savior? Have you been down with him in the baptismal waters and come back up a new, a new creation? If, if, if any of those steps are ones that you haven't made, maybe God's calling you today to make them. 